Hey everybody, this is Josh here, the Gray Bearded Green Beret, and welcome to my new bushcraft camp. Now it goes without saying, you know, we're not always practicing survival skills or bushcraft or preparedness. Sometimes we just want to go out in the woods and enjoy ourselves, and that's what I'm going to do in this series, is just take some traditional gear, take a raw spot like this, and I'm going to turn it into more of a long-term, kind of semi-permanent bushcraft camp so it's pretty windy so i'll try to speak loud enough for the for the most part i'm just going to be doing just going to be setting things up and i'll talk about a few things here and there uh, but it's not designed to be a color by number uh, you know teach you isolated skills this is more of a skills in context kind of format uh, which i think is a lot more enjoyable for youtube uh, the sun's going down probably probably have about three hours of sunlight left uh, so the first thing that I'm going to do because I want to get a shelter set up get my bedding ready uh, before that goes down uh, but I also want to take have some time some daylight to actually cook myself some dinner gonna make some steaks gonna make some uh, vegetable kebabs uh, on a campfire so I want to put a keyhole fire together a lot of stuff that I want to get done before that goes down and hopefully capture it for you guys before it's time for me to, to lay down and get some shut eye so uh, I'm gonna get started on that uh, as far as site selection you know it's no different the five W's of site selection I want to be pretty close to wood so I have uh, construction material uh, and also material to burn in my fire I want to be close to a water source it just so happens they're probably I don't know 50 meters behind me there's a stream running through and that's spring fed there's actually a spring probably 125 meters from here that I'll be able to get my water from so pretty excited about that uh, there's a field full of wild edibles behind me here, one on that side, so a lot of resources around. But anyway, 5Ws wise, um, I'm close to a water source. I've got plenty of wood that I could use. Uh, I'm also away from Widowmakers. Uh, I'm away from the wind. I've got kind of a natural windbreak with all these trees. And the way this slopes down, uh, the wind kind of goes right down through the valley. Uh, and I'm up a little bit higher so that at nighttime, all that cold air is going to sink down there on the creek. And I'm up above that. Uh, so. Widowmakers, wind, wigglers. Uh, as far as up here, I'm in uh, upstate New York in the Adirondacks. This particular area, uh, there could be timber rattlesnakes, but I've never seen one in the wild here, so I'm not too worried about that. About what we've got for wigglers around here might be a, a centipede or something like that, but it's, it's nothing that I'm worried about. Uh, but otherwise, pretty good spot, so I'm gonna get started putting that shelter together. First things first, gotta get my gear up off the ground. I've got the back that goes with this gray beard. So I'm gonna take this white pine and I'm gonna use that and love white pine. What I especially like about this, it's gonna be dual purpose, is listen to this. All that is dry kindling right there. So I'm gonna get it out of my way, but I'm also gonna use that for my fire a little bit later. I won't use it for my sustaining fuel because I'm going to actually cook over those coals. But to get it started, nothing wrong with using this. Especially with the white pines. The white pines have a lot less terpenes in them than the reds and the yellows. Uh, which is why they're not particularly good for making fat wood and all that. That's pretty. Got a lot of life left in that one. But uh, the, uh, the reds have a lot more terpenes. Uh, and the yellows as well. Uh, so you'll typically find fatwood on those more often than you will on, on a white pine. On a white pine, maybe the small center heartwood you'll find some fatwood on. But anyway, uh, the idea behind using a softwood like a pine for a kindling is that it burns quickly. Uh, it just doesn't burn for very long. So, But it'll burn long enough to transfer to something more sustainable like a hardwood. Uh, in this case, I've got a lot of maple and hickory, uh, some oak. Uh, that's what I'll use to make some sustaining fuel coals. Kind of get these out of the way a little bit. Hang on to those. That's got some flex in it. It might have some fat wood in there. Let's take a look. Now these didn't readily snap off. And they had some flex to them, which is typical when there's some fat wood going on. Uh, in the white pines so that flex tells me that this dead branch is not completely dead or it's not dry inside so that leads me to believe there could possibly be 
and that would. Let me take a look. I would say not much in that one. Let's try these two. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. A little bit. Let me show you that. So looking at this, I've got those little darker spots right there. That nice dark orange rich spot right there. Those are that's resin. So I mean I wouldn't really call this fat wood, but it's at least uh, it's at least thick wood. We'll call it thick wood. It's got a little bit in there. A little bit thick. Not quite fat though. One of the other cool things about getting to just come out and just do my thing and enjoy myself in the woods, and for you too, is to test out new gear. And I actually have a hand forged marlin spike now to add to my tool roll but uh, this was something I really wanted uh, drew it out on a piece of paper I sent it over to a young blacksmith named Jameson that's over in Pathfinder knife and tool uh, and Jameson hammered this out I believe he said from an old tractor spring or something like that but a really really hard spring steel uh, so gave himself a good gave himself a good uh, beat down making this for me and really appreciate it uh, so this is a one-of-a-kind marlin spike and I'm going to use it as a marlin spike uh, this is just some some Cecil rope that I actually created I actually used this I made I had some Cecil twine and a rope spinner and if we get enough time you know someday I'll show you how to actually make rope with that but this is just a you know 10 or 12 foot utility rope that I made uh, three ply and then I whipped uh, with the ends with some uh, number 12 I think bank line and uh, dipped that to further protect the end from fraying in some beeswax so uh, just a 10 or 12 foot utility rope I find it's useful for a lot of different things uh, not the least of which is hanging your gear uh, so I'm just going to tie up on one end I'm going to tie a bowline knot uh, plenty of videos out there on my channel of how to tie the bowline there we go not putting a lot of weight on this, so I'm not going to put an overhand security knot in there. But I'm going to take that end of the line bowline and make a running bowline by pulling that end through. I'm going to put it up kind of high. Cinch that tight. Now I'm going to do my marlin spike hitch, appropriately named because it's a hitch, which is another name for an anchor knot, that incorporates a marlin spike or a toggle if you don't have one of these. Uh, but it's the same thing. So creating like I'm doing an overhand slip take my marlin spike place it through the marlin spike hitch and tighten her down there you go like it was made for it a couple of these small maple saplings uh, that's actually a hickory I believe that one's actually dead and that's a maple but anyway some of these there's a lot of these small maple saplings so they're kind of in the way um, but you know that's where my nature decided they needed to go but I need to go right here so in order for me to establish my shelter I also need some green poles to establish a tripod I'm going to build a forester's tent uh, to start off with here and kind of base out of that but uh, so I need the green poles so I'll go ahead and take these out of the way from here because I need to clear this area for my shelter. So I'm going to come down as low as I can so I don't leave any stumps sticking up. Take my silky and I'll just take these down. There's one. That one's a little small for construction purposes, so I'll probably take this one as well. And I'll call that thin. So this is a new mushroom for me. You can see growing right here. There's one coming up right there. There's one back there. They're all over the place springing up right now. So that tells me conditions are right for this particular species. Uh, I'm trying to stay out of my own light here. But this is Cortinarius 
violaceous. Um, it is edible, which is cool, but it's also known as the uh, violet web cap or violet cork. And uh, I'm not sure if you can tell, you know, in the camera, I'll try to get it in the light here, but just how dark purple that is. It is a gilled mushroom and it's got kind of an orange rusty color to it. And what's interesting about these is they're supposed to smell like cedar, you know, like cedar wood. Uh, me, honestly, I think they smell like, they smell kind of like a black licorice candy. Uh, so that's another key thing about uh, edibles and medicinal plants is is don't just look at it and try to try to identify something by look you know don't be afraid to feel it uh, depending on what it is uh, but you know feel it smell it uh, kind of use all your senses to engage uh, and a lot of times that you know just the sense of smell uh, alone will help you distinguish something that that maybe you maybe not a hundred percent sure on uh, but with anything, if you're not 100% sure, don't consume it. Uh, this is a new mushroom for me. Uh, so I'm going to do a little more research on it. All right, so I want to introduce you to a piece of gear you probably haven't seen from me before. This is the John Pack bed sleeve. And essentially, you know, what it is, is a canvas sleeve that's open on both ends and it has grommets on both ends as well, reinforced grommets. Uh, but it's an untreated canvas, you know, so that you can breathe when you lay on it. But one of the reasons I, I like this particular product and why I'm excited about trying it out and trying it out in the different co configurations it was designed for is because John Pack, Jonathan, uh, was actually going through one of our courses at the Pathfinder School. And uh, Dave, Canter uh, Dave Canterbury and I sat with him uh, and we're talking about product design and development. Uh, and one of the things that Dave wanted was uh, a bed sleeve uh, which we use for our tripod shelters a lot of times to get up off the ground uh, and as well as the tripod shelter we also use it for making an improvised hammock so something as simple as a canvas sleeve can assist you in doing all that and you know kind of I got to thinking about it and to make it more versatile you know my input into the design of this product was to add grommets along the bottom so that not only could you use it as a hammock or as a raised bed, but you could also lace the bottom together and fill it with browse to make an old school kind of browse mattress where you fill it with debris, leaf litter, uh, things like that to make your insulated. So making a mattress, a browse mattress with this. So that was my input into this particular product. Uh, and I think that he did an outstanding job with it. So I'm gonna show you several different ways to use this. But for this particular instance, I'm gonna be starting off with a Forester's tent uh, so I'm going to be sleeping on the ground, so I'm just going to make a browse mattress. All right, so that particular rope that I made was too thick, so I'll make a custom one for this later. Uh, I'll just use a piece of Cecil twine to go through and lace it up, and that'll work for our purposes right now. It doesn't really matter how you lace it up, so long as when you pull it tight it actually closes it up and holds it together so that your debris doesn't spill out the bottom. And they set together at the bottom, tie this off, and that'll cut down on how much debris actually comes out of here. Now that that's tied off, you know, I'm just gonna fill it up with leaf litter. I'm not gonna take leaf litter from this immediate area uh, because that's already insulation on the ground. I'm gonna fill this with insulation from another area close by and then bring it back up here. That way I'm not taking away from insulation and the duff layer that's already occurring. So this particular area right up on top of the hill there is where I'm putting my camp and I'm down on the low ground next to the creek. There's another big white pine here and what's great about the white pine is it has a lot of soft needles. So I'm gonna get a lot of duff here and I'm just gonna keep moving around until this browse bed mattress is full. Of course it goes without saying that, you know, obviously a thermo rest is easier. So if anything, you know, going to these traditional ways uh, is not so much a matter of efficiency or lightweight um, 
or anything like that. There's a lot of modern ways that you can do things that, you know, are definitely a lot more convenient. But, you know, I think that, you know, using traditional gear and kind of taking a look at where we came from as woodsmen, uh, kind of, a, I think at least enhances, you know, our ability to be kind of that modern woodsman. We can, we know how it used to be. We know how it is now. We can kind of pick and choose which ones we prefer. And I think sometimes it's nice to go back and kind of revisit some of these older techniques like the browse bag, uh, you know, so yeah, it's a little bit of extra work, but you know, my point is to be out here enjoying the wilderness and kind of using traditional gear and kind of getting back in touch with that traditional woodsman style, you know, so I don't mind a little extra work. Uh, I don't want to go out and have those modern conveniences where I run out, I set up camp, everything's good, and I just sit there and watch the fire the rest of the time. I want to experience the outdoors, I want to enjoy being out here, and I want to get back in touch with kind of the woodsmen of old, you know, the, the Nesmucks, the Horace Kepharts. Speaking of Nesmuck, a lot of mosquitoes around here, so after I finish filling this up and dragging it to camp, I'm going to get some of my punky dope out and give myself a liberal application of that to keep these mosquitoes at bay. But it looks like it's going to rain, or at least threatening to, so I want to get my shelter set up for the night for sure, and then maybe think about getting a, uh, a fire set up uh, so I can cook some steaks before those go bad. I don't really have any refrigeration out here, but I do have steaks. Uh, but yeah, so yes, definitely more convenient ways to do this and if that's your goal is, is convenience and ease uh, and just going out and you know say if I'm going out you know to go for a hike and that's my primary purpose uh, and I just want to set up a quick camp that's one thing uh, it just needs to be adequate needs to be fast because that's not my focus um, but that is my focus right now so anyway I think that's about full Pretty big old mattress right there. I'll drag that off the camp. So that is a fat mattress. Now I want four inches of insulation compressed. I'll have four to six inches on this. What I'm going to do is lace up the front real quick, spread this out nice and even, test it out, and then I'll base my Forester's tent around this mattress. I've got my bed set up and, you know, like we were talking about before, you know, Thermarest is a lot quicker, but uh, Thermarest is not this big and uh, comfortable, I will say. So you do a little work, but it pays dividends in comfort. Uh, and there are some, probably some sticks in here that I'll feel, uh, but they're small uh, just from shoving duff in here. And this isn't the best time to show you this one because uh, right now, you know, the ground, the leaf litter on the ground is, uh, is quite damp. Uh, so there is some moisture in here, but this isn't a wax canvas, so it's breathable. Um, and uh, either way, wet insulation or insulation, it will protect you from conduction on the ground. Uh, but it's not the most ideal time to show you this. It's just what I happen to have. A little bit later in the fall when there's a lot more uh, leaf debris on a dry day is when you'd want to fill this. Uh, and it wouldn't take quite so long, be quite as heavy. Uh, pretty easy thing to do. So this is a John Pack bed sleeve used as a browse bed. And what I would do typically is I don't want to have, I'm not going to carry a pillow or anything, but you could carry a small browse pillow, like a small sleeve, fill that with browse and use that as a pillow. But I typically have my weather wool with me no matter what. And so I just kind of fold that up into a pillow and I do that whether I'm sleeping on the ground or in a hammock. I don't sleep in this because I want to put it on immediately once I get up. Um, so 
So I've got my weather wool pillow. Typically, if I'm using something besides a mummy sleeping bag that comes up over the head, you know, you lose most of your heat through your head. So I'll put on a stocking cap instead of a ball cap. And then I've got my wool blanket to cover up with. So all in all, you know, this is a fairly comfortable mattress and it protects me completely from the ground. Then for me, I'm also a side sleeper. So I can kind of wallow me out a spot in here. And that's actually extremely comfortable. Uh, a lot more comfortable than I would be laying on a thin piece of foam. So uh, just an option to think about. Uh, I really like this and there's a couple different other configurations you can use it in that I'll show you probably in, in the future as this bushcraft camp develops. You can take a nap right now. The wind whipping through the pines and the maples. You can tell as windy as it is how much of a windbreak I have down here. There's almost no wind right here. So pretty effective shelter location. I would say it's whipping up the side of the hill. The pines are bent over. The maples up higher than me are bent over, but but I'm fine. Good spot. Now I get some overhead cover.